Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today we're going to explore the relationship between matrices and game trees. And there's basically one big lesson to be learned here. Once again, this is Selton's game in matrix form. And here it is as a game tree. What you need to know is that for every game tree, there's only one matrix game that represents it. But every matrix game can have multiple extensive form representations. So let's first look at how you convert a game tree to a matrix. And this conversion process is actually very simple. First, you look at the combination of moves each player has. Let's start with player one. Well, there are only two combination of moves that player one has. You can either go up or you can go down. So that tells us we need to have two rows in the matrix, one for up and one for down. Then we look at the combination of moves that player two has available, and she only has left or right. So that means there will only be two columns as well. And that gives us everything we need except for the payoffs. And filling those in is as simple as going down the game tree and seeing what the payoffs are for those particular moves. Let's start with up and left. And if you follow the game tree, you eventually get to 3-1. So player 1 moves up, player 2 moves left, and you arrive at this 3-1 outcome. And we toss it into there just like that. Very simple. Now let's move to up right. And here this is going to be the very same process, except player 2 is moving right. So 1 goes up, 2 goes right, and you end up at the 0-0 outcome and we plug it into here just like that. Now let's look at down left, and this is where things can start getting tricky. The issue is that player two never moves left if player one moves down. So the temptation may be to put three one in the matrix for the slot because that's the end game if player two moves left, but you really have to start at the beginning of the game and see what kind of outcome you get. And here it's gonna be two two. Player one moves down and the game simply ends, thus denying player two the opportunity to even move left. So instead of actually reaching this 3-1 outcome, you end up at the 2-2 outcome instead. So we toss 2-2 into the matrix. And since player two never gets a chance to move right if player one moves down for the same reason, down right is going to produce a 2-2 result as well. And that completes the matrix. What I just taught you is the process we use to convert extensive form games into matrices. And as I said, that's gonna produce the same matrix every time. So that actually takes care of the first part of what I claimed earlier. Now let's take care of the second part. Every matrix has multiple game trees that could represent it. And I think the easiest way to do this is to simply show you another form of Selton's game. So here player one moves up or down, and then player two moves left or right, and the game ends. So all this dashed line here means is that player two does not know what player one did when she makes her move. We'll later use this dashed line for games of incomplete information, but we can also use it for simultaneous move games like The Prisoner's Dilemma, The Stag Hunt, or Matching Pennies, or in this case, another form of Selton's game. And it's also important to point out that left and right here are not distinct moves. Uh, so there's two instances of left, right, right? So there's left here, left here, and there's right here and right here. And both of these lefts and rights are actually the same thing because player two doesn't know what's happening when she chooses left or she chooses right. She doesn't know that player one has moved up or down. So for that reason, these lefts and these rights are actually the same move, even though we had to put them on the tree twice in order to get the outcomes of the game that we want out of this. So basically this means we can draw out a different matrix for Selton's game, but now it's a simultaneous move game. This is the real Selton's game, but here it is sequential. Player one makes a move, player two sees this move, and then player two makes a move of her own. And if you convert this version of the game into a matrix, you will find that it produces the same matrix as a sequential game. I'm gonna leave this slide up here for a few seconds so you can pause the video and go through the conversion process for yourself. But already you can see the limitations of a matrix game. We don't know what the actual game is. If you just give me this, then I could be trying to, or you could be trying to represent the game as this, or you could be trying to represent the game as this. And there's a big difference between the two, right? The simultaneous move game has two subgame perfect equilibria, up left and down right. And in this case, they are just the Nash equilibria of the matrix game. However, up left is the unique subgame perfect equilibrium for the sequential game. And if you just give me this, I cannot differentiate between the two. That's why we're going to focus predominantly on extensive form games from now on. 